Okay, everyone, welcome to the uh, second to last installment of the GT Neuro seminar series for the semester. We're very excited to have John Reynolds joining us virtually from California, Pacific time at the Salk Institute. Um, John has been a leader in the field uh, in studying the circuits and the mechanisms of visual perception, in particular visual attention. Um, he studied economics as an undergraduate and then got his PhD at Boston University and his postdoctoral work was at the NIH with uh, Bob Desimone when he was still there. And he really, that's where he pioneered a lot of influential studies looking at the uh, circuit basis, the cellular basis of visual attention in primates and the primate visual system. Um, and he is, after that, he moved to the Salk Institute where he's been since 2000, I think, 2001, um, and where he's continued pioneering the really detailed circuits and cellular basis for visual perception, visual attention. Um, he has also technically been at the forefront of what um, recording and stimulating methods are used in primates in particular. Um, I don't know to, if he's going to talk about this today, but really pioneering optogenetic methods in, in behaving primates and also different types of neural recording techniques. And he's also moving to uh, use all of these behavioral, psychophysical, and recording techniques in marmosets to really unleash their uh, hopeful genetic potential for studying the cellular basis of the visual system and visual attention. So John, uh, very excited to have you here today and looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bilal, and uh, I want to thank you all for having me here. I wish I could be there in person with you all and meet you, uh, but maybe another time. Um, I'm really uh, very happy to be here, though, and to have this opportunity to talk about um, recent research in the laboratory. I'm going to focus much of the talk on a paper that was just published last month um, in which we uh, show that in awake behaving uh, visual cortex, there are traveling waves that regulate perceptual sensitivity. Um, but I'm going to begin my talk uh, by just setting the stage, uh, describing a few studies uh, prior to this in which we um, looked at neuronal response variability and um, discovered that um, the variability of neuronal responses is subject to cognitive state, in particular that when attention is directed to a stimulus, this reduces the amount of variability in the neuronal signal. Um, and so, uh, you know, the overall theme of the talk is this tension between this earlier work that showed that um, variability is harmful to perception and is suppressed by attention, and this newer work showing that a form of variability, traveling waves, can improve perception. And how do we reconcile that? Uh, and I'll finish with a theoretical model that can bring these two themes together. Uh, so as Bilal said, we, we work in two animal models. So the first several um, results that I'll talk about are from the rhesus macaque. Um, uh, but we have begun uh, more recently using marmosets as well in my laboratory. Uh, and though they do have the potential to be developed as genetic animals, um, and there are um, a number of lineages that have been developed and will continue to be developed, uh, in the work that I'm going to speak about today, we're really making use of their lysis and cortex, which enables us to look at um, entire areas of the brain, in this case area MT, simultaneously over the entire visual field uh, to discern these, these traveling waves. So, so the first, um, uh, here's a quick outline. I'm first going to talk about old work from Jude Mitchell and Christy Sundberg in my lab, uh, showing that attention reduces individual neuronal response variability and follow-up work in which they showed that it reduces low frequency, that when we attend to a stimulus, it reduces low frequency co-variation in neural activity. And then I'm going to um, touch on more recent work from Anur von Nandi, uh, uh, who showed that if we uh, use optogenetics to induce low frequency correlations, this uh, actively impairs uh, uh, sensory perception, in particular orientation discrimination in that study. 
Uh, then I'll talk about this newer work um, showing that fluctuations in neural activity in the form of traveling waves reduce perceptual threshold. Uh, and then I'll try to bring all of those together in a, a model which we call the sparse wave model that shows that waves naturally occur uh, under um, the asynchronous irregular regime, which if you're in sort of deep in the theoretical world, you'll know is an important um, idea in computational neuroscience. And it's a state that has certain computational advantages. Um, and that the waves traversing the network that's in this state need not induce correlations or change individual neuronal response variability. Um, so this is work from 2007, so it's very old now. Um, but this is work from uh, Jude Mitchell, who's now a professor at uh, Rochester, and Christy Sundberg, who was a graduate student uh, at the time in the lab. Um, and then this work, um, we made use of, a, of, a, of an attentional task in which um, the monkey was to fixate a point at the center of the screen and then mentally track stimuli as they moved through space. And at the end of the trial, uh, the monkey would re report which stimuli were highlighted at the beginning of the trial. So it was a task that required the animal to attentively track the stimuli as they moved through space. And during their trajectory, the stimuli would pause at some point in time for about a second with one of the stimuli sitting in the receptive field. So we could compare the responses of individual neurons in a CAC area of B4 uh, when the monkey was either attending to tracking the stimulus as it moved through this space or uh, attending to other stimuli. And we saw um, the, the typical form of modulation, which is an increase in mean firing rate. So here you see more spikes when the monkey attended to the stimulus in the receptive field than when it attended away. But uh, we also noticed that the neuronal variability was lower when the monkey attended into the receptive field. And for this particularly strongly modulated neuron, there was actually a reduction in the standard deviation of the spike count. Um, but more generally, we saw that the FANO factor, the variance in the spike count divided by the neuron's response rate, mean rate, uh, was reduced by attention. Um, and uh, here is an, in, an index, just a difference over some index in, of the FANO factors across the population of the B4 neurons that Jude and Christy recorded, uh, with um, the neurons showing statistically significant changes in FANO factor shown in black. And so uh, this was a very robust finding, um, and it was the first study showing that attention or any cognitive state regulated the variability of neuronal responses. Um, so Jude and Christie then went on to do uh, additional analyses where they recorded from pairs of neurons uh, and looked at their covariation. So this is an example of what you might see. This is actually, these are recordings in anesthetized macaque V1, uh, courtesy of uh, Adam Cohn. And each line here is, is the spiking activity of individual neuron. And what you can see is there are periods of quiescence separated by periods of higher activity. And so if you imagine recording from a pair of these neurons, you would see correlations. Now these are particularly robust. These are shown, this data is in the anesthetized animal. But we do see um, correlations between pairs of neurons in area V4. Um, and um, so we thought about this in the following way. This is a figure that's adapted from Aberbach, Latham, and Puget's review of correlated variability. So I'd like you to imagine that you're recording from a, a pair of neurons, neuron one and two here, uh, um, and we've presented a stimulus, this rightward leaning grating to the two stimuli, I mean to the, to, to the visual system, and we're recording from these two neurons. And each point, each black or dark blue point here is um, a firing rate on an individual trial. And if we then present a, another stimulus, a leftward leaning grating, the, um, the uh, responses are here shown in orange. And um, by sort of construction here, these distributions are positively correlated with one another. And these neurons, you'll note, both prefer this leftward leaning grating. So they share tuning in common with one another. If we superimpose those points, um, you can see that because of the correlation between the responses trial by trial, there's a degree of overlap, um, and this uh, will have the effect of reducing the ability of an ideal observer and presumably the idea of uh, the visual system itself to discriminate between these two stimuli. But if we shuffle the points so that they are now decorrelated, then the degree of correlation is reduced. But this is one example, but it's um, it just intended to illustrate the idea that, that, uh, that correlations among neurons that have shared preference can impair 
your ability to discriminate stimuli. Uh, and Jude and Christy went into the same database that they had recorded cell by cell, and they looked at pairs. Uh, and they found that in V4, there was a fairly robust degree of correlation, trial by trial, just like in the hypothetical example. Um, and uh, they found that when attention was directed away from the receptive field, that is, here we're directing attention, the green circle, to the left while recording from a pair of neurons in the right visual field. Um, there was a higher degree of correlation than when the monkey was directed to attend into the receptive field. Um, they quantified this over um, um, many pairs of neurons. Uh, and this plot on the left shows the spike-spike coherence of these pairs. Um, and with data shown in blue for the unattended condition and in red for the attended condition. So what they found was a very robust reduction in the degree of spike-spike coherence, or a, which is a measure of correlation, um, um, particularly at frequencies of five degrees, uh, five, five hertz uh, or so, um, but, but to some extent at higher frequencies, all the way out to about 20 hertz. And notably, we saw no change in coherence at higher frequencies. Uh, when we looked at this uh, and computed just the mean value, or the median value, sorry, of the change in um, decorrelation in these low frequencies, we saw that the correlation was reduced by a factor of two. So there was a substantial reduction in the, in the amount of correlation. And uh, we adapted um, analyses that, um, that Zohari, Shadlin, and Newsom had introduced back in the 90s to quantify the degree of sort of signal to noise uh, ratio as a function of the number of neurons that we uh, pool. So this is a sort of a hypothetical construct. It's a model. And so it's fraught with its own assumptions, but it enabled us to come up with an estimate of what the impact of this decorrelation was on, um, on, a, on, on the signal to noise ratio of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, neural signals in V4. In other words, how well could an ideal observer discriminate the stimuli from one another? Uh, and what we found was that when we um, uh, presented, when, when, we, when we stripped out the change in correlation artifact, artificially and only allowed the mean firing rate to increase as it did, this increased the signal to noise ratio by about 10% at asymptote with a large number of pairs. But when we um, instead uh, maintained the mean firing rate but allowed the decorrelation to occur, this increased the signal to noise ratio by 40%, uh, 39%. So the um, conclusion of this is that about 80% about of the benefit of attention is attributable to this reduction in low frequency correlated variability, um, which was something that, that uh, until then no one had really even looked at. Uh, although I should say that Marlene Cohen and John Mansell were looking at the same problem and very soon after we published our work, um, they've, they published beautiful work uh, that's very much in agreement with what we had found. Um, so Anur Anandi joined the lab at that time uh, and we had just developed some of the techniques that Bilal mentioned in which we, um, uh, that enable us to do optogenetics in the primate effectively. Uh, and so uh, we wanted to test this uh, empirically. There was a great deal of theoretical work that had been done saying why correlations could be harmful to perception, uh, but no one had ever tested it by inducing correlations. And so this is a uh, work of Anurban Nandi and Jojo Nassi. Anurban's now a professor at Yale, and Anurban uh, and Jojo is a senior scientist at Enscopix. Um, the two of them worked together on a project in which we, uh, we, we thought we could introduce correlations by lightly tickling the cortex with a laser that fluctuated either at low frequencies in the range where attention actively suppresses correlations or at higher frequencies where it had no effect. Um, and so the idea, just conceptually, is, is sort of if attention has decorrelated the signal when the monkey needs to attend to the stimulus, but we reintroduce the correlations that were removed by attention, can we show it? an impairment in discrimination consistent with these sort of theoretical models. Um, so the approach that we took in this work was to um, remove the dura matter that protects the cortex uh, over area V4 um, and replace it with a silicon material. This is based on an approach that Anna Rowe developed for, um, for intrinsic imaging uh, 
and it's worked beautifully for us. In fact, for those who are interested, I'd be happy to help you get started using this. It's, uh, we don't have any monkeys that have intact tours anymore um, because it removes the need to remove tissue that grows on, on the surface of the dura, which can be a, the bane of your existence if you're a primate neurobiologist. Um, but what we can do here is we can um, inject virus through the uh, peel surface uh, and then uh, cause expression of opsins. In this case, it, we were using opsins that were driven by the CAM kinase promoter, and so they led to selective expression in excitatory cells. Uh, and then after allowing time for the virus to, um, uh, for the protein to express, we could then go back to the site of the injection with the fiber optic cable connected to a laser, and we could regulate the neural activity. Um, and so the paradigm was as follows. The monkey was presented with an attentional cue directing it to attend to one location or another. And then within the receptive field, we presented a, a, a target. And there was a similar target presented at the other out, extra receptive field, contralateral receptive field. And over um, several presentations, the monkey would see an orientation change and needed to dis dis discriminate that change. Um, the manipulation then was to induce correlations at either 5 or 40 hertz, the free, lower high frequencies where attention does or does not suppress um, correlations, and ask if this led to a change in the, um, in the monkey's ability to perform the task. So we performed the exact same trial, randomly interdigitating low frequency and high frequency uh, laser stimulation. Uh, and we could, uh, without strongly regulating the mean firing rates of the cells by just lightly tickling the cortex with very um, modest fluctuations in laser intensity. We can induce correlations between pairs of cells. So these, this, this, these plots show individual cells with um, phase locking of spiking that is uh, locked to the, to, the, uh, to the fluctuation of the laser intensity. Um, uh, and I could show you that, that this did introduce uh, correlations between cells. Uh, and the main finding was that low frequency stimulation does impair performance. So here uh, are two examples of sessions in, in which um, low frequency laser stimulation impaired the, the ability of the monkey to, to, to do the orientation discrimination task. So in um, gray, we show the psychometric functions as a function of the orientation change magnitude. Um, and you know you can see here that, uh, that the monkeys were, were at 75% or so with modest two or four degree orientation changes. Um, and then superimposed in blue are the psychometric functions fit to data recorded when we were inducing these low frequency correlations. Um, and, we, and we see that across the population of recordings, there's, a, there's a, um, a measurable and consistent reduction in orientation discrimination. Um, now, this effect was spatially specific. So here's a third session, session C, showing the same kind of pattern, a rightward shift of the um, psychometric function. Um, but on the same, in that same session, when we directed the monkey to attend away from the site where we were inducing this correlation, we saw no measurable change in, uh, in orientation discrimination at this other site. So it's specific to the site where we uh, injected the virus and we were driving these correlations. And it was also frequency specific. So if we went to the high frequencies where um, at 40 hertz where attention does not modulate correlated variability in, in our earlier work, um, we see that there's no effect. Um, and these, uh, and, and similarly, as you would expect, when the monkey attends away, there's no effect at the higher frequencies. So this, um, um, I, I don't have time to go into all the data, but, but, but the correlations were comparable in magnitude. So we titrated the laser so that the magnitude of the correlations that were induced at these two frequencies were uh, very similar to one another. Uh, and from this, we can conclude, I think, that, uh, that low frequency correlation does, in fact, impair perception. Uh, and so we were very happy to see this result. Um, and it fit nicely into a tight little bundle with our earlier findings. Uh, and so we... You know, at this point, we, we felt confident that we could say that, that it, the reason that we see attention-dependent reductions in coherence is that these low-frequency correlations are harmful to perception. Um, and that was all fine and good, but um, 
Then we stepped outside of looking at pairs of neurons and we started to look at entire populations of neurons. And so um, this is more recent work. It was just published um, um, last month. And this is the work of a, of a really wonderful postdoc, Zach Davis, who's, by the way, going on the job market soon. Um, and uh, another person, Lyle Muller, who at the time was a postdoc in Terry Sanofsky's laboratory. Uh, and this is a collaboration between Terry's lab and my lab, as well as um, with important help from Julio Martinez Trujillo. And so the idea here was uh, to record using um, a, me a method that enables us to record across a population of, of neurons and to look at the spatiotemporal patterns that occur. Um, and so we implanted Utah arrays over area NT in the common marmoset. And the, you know, the marmoset is virtually lysisymphalic. There's one big sulcus and a little wrinkle, but basically the whole cortical surface is sitting right there under the skull and is available for recording. And so this is the first time that we, uh, that in, a, in an awake animal that anyone has been able to look across the entire um, visual field of MT, uh, contralateral to the array and see what's, uh, what's going on. Um, so this is um, uh, part, part of what we recorded were, were single units and multi-unit activity. Um, and this is an example of, I think, a multi-unit recording uh, from a single electrode that was aligned with the position of a visual stimulus. Um, and so you can see across many, many trials, uh, there's a period of, uh, uh, on the left of the line before the stimulus appears, where there's sort of variable spiking at a lower rate. And then uh, the stimulus appears at the time of the vertical line. And after a brief delay, there's a robust visual response. Um, and um, that's one measure that we, that we can take from the, from the Utah array. But um, in addition to that, we can record local field potentials, which are um, just uh, lower frequency taken from the, from the full field potential. So we filter these um, from one to 200 hertz. And the local field potential is a measure that um, is somewhat debated, but um, it is a measure of the, of the change in voltage in the vicinity of the electrode, and it results from the return currents that occur as neurons um, are active. So there are, are synaptic currents and membrane uh, currents due to spiking that sum and so it's a measure that enables you to look at um, uh, small populations of neurons around the tip of the electrode. And in fact, there's work dating back to the 70s um, in which uh, simultaneous recordings using intracellular approaches have been combined with um, local field potential uh, recordings. And if you conditionalize both those field recordings, intracellular and, and local field recordings, on the spiking activity, you can see that they're mirror images of one another. And so I think a, a, a reasonable way of thinking about the local field potential is that it, that it is something like a measure of the intracellular potentials across a population of neurons near the tip, the tip of the electrode. Now, for those of you who are recording in these, <coughs> these um, local field potential, uh, uh, who have recorded local field potentials, this will look familiar. Prior to the stimulus, the average local field potential is fairly flat. Um, and then at the time of the stimulus evoked response, where all of the neurons or population of neurons are responding to the stimulus, there's a big deflection uh, that you can easily see. Um, but in fact, if we look at an individual local field potential trace recorded on, a, on an individual trial, here shown in pink, uh, you can see that for this neuron, you really, if you were asked, when did the stimulus occur? And all you were armed with was the, was the pink trace, the local field potential from that individual trace, you would be at a loss. Um, and we can look at this in a couple of other examples. So this is a, another, another um, uh, MT neuron that we recorded uh, in the marmoset as it sat there looking at the screen and waited for a stimulus to appear. Um, and you can see again that, that, that for this stimulus, which was 2%, less than 2% contrast, so it was just at the perceptual threshold of the monkey, um, you couldn't see it in the mean, and you couldn't really tell when it occurred in the, in the uh, individual trial. And this is shown on the right in this beehive plot, where we're showing the relative power of the local field potential prior to and after the appearance of the stimulus. 
Uh, each small gray spot is uh, for a single stimulus presentation. And the, um, the gray uh, point that's a little larger at zero is the, um, is the mean of that population. And so you can see that on an individual trial, the, the mean is sitting there, the, 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 the mean uh, of the power across all of these is right in the middle of all of the individual trials. So you really couldn't see uh, anything. And, and the black is the trial average response. So even in the aggregate, if you look at the, at the uh, relative power prior to and after the appearance of the stimulus, in the mean response of the local field potential, it's still sitting right in the middle of all of the trials. And so you could kind of make it out, but it's very difficult. Even if we increase the stimulus to a very visible 10%, um, you can see that although in the mean now, the black point in the beehive and the black trace, you can make out the stimulus approach response, um, the, um, the uh, uh, individual uh, points in the beehive, are, are, although shifted upward now, uh, are, um, are still quite variable and it's still difficult to see. And so the main point that I'm making here is that if you look at the local field potential on an individual trial, um, the variability in the neuronal response, which is a measure of the variability of small population of neurons around your electrode, uh, is quite variable and is on the order of magnitude of the stimulus of response itself. You saw a hint of that in the, in the movie from Adam Cohn. There's a lot of fluctuations, but what we're showing here is that even in the awake animal, there are large fluctuations in the population. Uh, and so the question then is, what do we make of those large fluctuations? What is their meaning? Um, and here uh, we apply a technique that was developed originally by Lyle Muller and colleagues um, prior to uh, this work. And it is a statistically rigorous way of, de of detecting spatiotemporal patterns in ongoing fluctuations like this. Um, and so the, um, I won't go into too much detail, but to briefly summarize, the idea is you record local field potentials across the entire array, so each electrode has its own measurement, and then you compute the gradient of the phase of the local field potential across space, and then you look for points that maximize the divergence of that. In other words, points that are like shown down below on the left, points where there is um, um, uh, a, a great change, the maximal change in, in the um, uh, in the uh, gradient of the local field potential field. Um, and these then make up candidate starting points for traveling waves. Um, and I'll tell you then what we do with those. So um, the first problem that we encountered though is that these fluctuations in local field potential are uh, very broad spec. They, they don't occur within a given frequency range. And in fact, the frequencies can change very quickly over time. Um, and so the Hilbert transform that one would normally apply to um, a, um, a signal to determine its phase does not really apply in broad spectral signals. There are problems that are, there are violations of the assumptions of the Hilbert transform. And so Lyle developed a method which, or a measure, which we refer to as generalized phase um, that gets around this. And it would be a little bit beyond the scope of this talk to go into detail, but essentially what we're computing here is the phase um, that uh, within the dominant power at any point in time. And so does that bias anything? Well, it, it really does. So if we now look at the degree to which spiking activity is um, phase locked to the local field potential, we can compute that phase locking and ask, you know, how related is the spiking activity to the phase using different measures of phase? So we can um, uh, compute this in, in, in narrow frequency ranges, which is the more traditional approach. Uh, but because of the problems that I mentioned with the Hilbert transform and the fact that if you pick a frequency range, you're gonna miss the power outside that frequency range uh, in this signal that changes its frequency over time, you can see that the, the spike phase coupling for, um, for, for particular bands of uh, local field, band task filtered local fields are uh, much lower, they're less predictive of the spiking activity than we have with this generalized phase measure. And this is partly due to the fact that, that uh, the frequencies vary over time 
But even if we look within the small number of trials where there was significant power within a particular band, which is only 12 and 7% of trials for these two bands, um, the generalized phase measure applied to every trial still provides a better measure of, of the relationship between spiking activity and the local field potential phase. So we believe this is a new measure that people should pay attention to and it's described in the paper that we just published uh, and happy to talk to people about how that could be incorporated in your work if you're interested. But the point is we now have a robust, meaningful way of thinking about phase for broad spectral signals. Um, and uh, so we can then go across the array, compute the, the generalized phase of the local field potential in each, each electrode uh, on the array. Um, and the, the approach then, the statistical approach, is we compute the change in phase uh, as a function of distance from the putative source. So this putative source being the maximum uh, divergence of the gradient field. Um, and here is an example in the middle lower panel um, of, of a case where there was a progression of phase away from this source. We compare that to a shuffling of the data to create a null distribution. And if the, um, if the uh, change in phase over time, over, I'm sorry, distance from, this, from the putative source is well outside this null distribution, we then assert that we found a wave. Um, so, um, here is an example of what it looks like in a simulation. So this is just noise. Uh, the red dots are candidate wave sources, but when a wave actually appears, the dot will turn green. And you'll see a big wave go out. And these are made to be obvious for you to see. Um, really the problem is that in the awake state, the data is very uh, noisy and the size of these waves are such that they would be difficult to detect. They look nothing like this. Uh, but this is really just to illustrate that false positives are, are rare. We can detect um, actual wave patterns. What we see, in fact, looks more like this. So these are unfiltered, uh, not spatially filtered, I should say, uh, recordings across the entire array. So each of the um, electrodes here is an individual uh, local field potential voltage. And these voltages have been selected from times when we detected a wave. So this is the sort of thing that we see. Uh, you can see here a wave that appears to be moving somewhat downward and to the right. Uh, and the um, uh, color coding from blue down to red is a measure of the amplitude, the, the, the uh, millivolts of recorded on the, um, on the individual electrodes. And so this is not spatially filtered. You're not seeing something that is artificial because we've superimposed a Gaussian on random noise or something. These are actually the independent or the individual recordings, local field potential recordings on the channels. Um, and so, you know, the waves are not simple. They're not like waves that look like they're crashing on the ocean shore. Um, they're somewhat variable in shape and they, and, and, um, they are heterogeneous. They don't seem to follow any particular trajectory from fovea to periphery or uh, anything like that, but, but, um, but they have a big impact on perception. Um, and so uh, first, before we get to perception, um, these, these are, this, this is a plot just showing the um, probability, the relative spiking probability um, as a function of the generalized phase of the local field potential uh, on trials where there were waves. Uh, on individual wave trials. Um, and the, the blue bars show the probability of spiking as a function of generalized phase of local field potential. Um, and so you can see that at plus and minus pi, which we think corresponds to a depolarized state, there is a higher likelihood of spontaneous spiking activity occurring than at phase zero, which we think corresponds to a hyperpolarized state. Um, and uh, so there's this robust phase dependence of spiking activity just as the monkey sits and fixates the spot on a blank screen. Um, the red dots show a control which was intended to look at whether we were seeing also changes in synchronous changes uh, in, in activity across the array. So we, here we just averaged the voltage together across all of the electrodes, computed their phase, and asked how the spiking activity depended upon that aggregate average 
response um, local field potential uh, value, and it was really not uh, modulated. So we conclude that traveling waves that we can detect uh, are strongly correlated with spiking activity, and there is really no um, evidence for synchrony across the entire array um, simultaneously occurring everywhere. Um, so this led us to think about, well, what do these waves do to perception? Um, so our first hypothesis is that sensory evoked responses um, that occur during the depolarized phase of the wave may be potentiated. So here um, we're showing a picture of, of, of MT. Imagine that we have lowered this electrode down to this uh, tip, sort of pole of MT. We're recording incoming spiking activity from a neuron. Um, we're recording the spiking activity of that neuron, and we're going to assume that there's some incoming spikes um, and that, we, that, are, that are impinging on the neuron that we're recording from. And uh, because at this moment, the traveling wave is such that the cell is in a hyperpolarized location in the map, um, we hypothesize that this, this will lead to low spiking activity. But as the wave traverses MT uh, and the uh, neuron that we're recording from uh, is within a more depolarized location in, in, in the retinotopic map, the firing rate evoked by the same incoming spike train uh, is elevated. And finally, when in a fully depolarized period, our hypothesis then is that, uh, that the spiking output of this neuron will be, will be strongly potentiated. Uh, our second hypothesis is that the potentiation of this sensory evoked response across the population of neurons there uh, increases the probability that the monkey will detect a target. Um, so to test this, we had the monkeys fixate a fixation point and perform a simple detection task um, in which the target appeared at a random position, a random point in time at one of two potential positions in space. Uh, it was a little drifting Gabor stimulus. And the monkey's uh, task was simply to make a saccade to the location of the target as soon as the monkey saw the target. So it's a simple detection task, couldn't be, couldn't be simpler. And if the monkey responded within a short window of time following the appearance of the target, uh, we rewarded the animal with some juice. Um, and so uh, Zach and Lyle measured the um, monkey's psychophysical performance. Uh, and here you can see two monkeys uh, shown in um, points shown in red and blue for the two of them. Um, and uh, so we were able to determine for each monkey the level of luminance contrast that was necessary for the animal to detect the target 50% of the time. And, um, and we focused on that luminance contrast for the rest of the experiment. Um, now, one critical thing that we worried about was that um, we do see a pretty large difference in firing rate depending upon whether the monkey detected the target or did not detect the target. Um, so here, on mistrials, failures to detect, the, the, the um, spiking activity was substantially lower than when the monkey detected the target. Why is this an issue? Well, we know from earlier work that Lyle uh, did uh, with um, Frederick Chavin and colleagues that simply presenting a stimulus within the visual field can trigger the propagation of a stimulus-evoked wave in the local field potential. And so uh, we could really have fooled ourselves into thinking that these spontaneously generated waves improved perception if we simply looked at the time of the stimulus evoked response and asked what did the wave look like? Because the higher spike rates on hit trials would presumably lead to larger and more robust waves. And we could then mistake cause and effect. We could think that the, that the spontaneously generated waves were causing a monkey to detect the target when in fact the detected target evoked a stronger response and triggered a larger wave. And so to remove that confound, we had to do some, some, uh, kind of some careful analysis. And I will step you through this, but the bottom line is we said, well, let's step backwards in time before the appearance of the target and ask whether the waves are in a particular state prior to the appearance of the target. Um, and if you imagine sort of metaphorically waves propagating in you know, your bathtub, the idea is that, that if they are in a particular state prior to the appearance of the target, then they might 
be more likely to be in a particular state at the time of the target. But the prior to the prior to the appearance of the target, there's no way that the that the that the um, future stimulus evoked response can reach backwards in time to fool us into thinking that we're seeing something systematic. And so, uh, so as the monkey performed this task, we computed, and I'll direct your attention to panel B here. Um, we recorded uh, local field potentials um, on individual trials, and um, we went backwards in time and asked if there was a point in time prior to the appearance of the target where hits, where hits, where detection of the target was um, preceded by a particular phase alignment. Um, and um, so in B, we show individual local field potential traces, and you can see visually that on these traces, at a point in time prior to the appearance of the target, the, um, the local field potential tended to be in a downward state. Um, so the phases were aligned at that point in time. And we can compute at that point in time what you see in panel C, which is um, the fraction of trials with a particular generalized phase. So there tended to be a particular phase at that point in time prior to the appearance of the target. And we found that this was true for hits, but not for misses. So if you look down below in the gray traces, the misses also show fluctuations in local field potential voltage, um, but they didn't show any preponderance of a particular phase. And so we could compute this measure of um, um, phase alignment, which is a sort of measure similar to the circular variance of this uh, generalized phase plot in C. And we can compute that over time. And by comparing to a null distribution, we could ask whether there was a period of time at which there was a particular tendency of, this, of, this, of the um, brain to be in a particular phase state for hits and misses. And in panel D, we're showing these analyses for two monkeys, for both monkeys. And you can see that though the timing was somewhat different, both monkeys showed a period of time where there was a highly significant phase alignment prior to the appearance of, tar of the target, but that this only occurred on, on hit trials and not on missed trials. Um, and in the analysis in shown in, in E, we compare this to a shuffle. So you, you, we can look then at the, at, the, at the evoked phase and ask, well, was the evoked response in the local field potential stronger on trials when there was this pre-target phase alignment. Um, and what we're showing here is, is, it, is, is in, in blue, the phase alignment for the individual trials added together. And then uh, in black was a shuffle control. So <clears throat> the black uh, distribution also shows a preference for a particular phase, but that is a reflection of um, of, uh, of what you would expect on average from the, from the, um, from the uh, hits. And uh, the difference between the blue trace and the black trace is the amount to which that's dependent upon the phase in the pre-phase, in the, in the pre-target phase uh, period. And so I realize that that is a very complicated thing for me to explain in a brief talk. But the, the point is that prior to the appearance of the target, the waves are, have a tendency to be in a particular state, which is revealed by this pre-target phase alignment, and that that predicts the likelihood that the monkey will, will, will detect the target at the time that the target appears. And so from this, we can conclude that um, through this indirect method, we can conclude that the, um, that the phase uh, of the local field potential predicts the ability of the monkey to subsequently detect a target without the potential confound of a stimulus evoked um, uh, way of uh, infiltrating our measure of, of phase alignment. Um, so then to get back to our um, two hypotheses, first the question of whether sensory responses evoked during the depolarized phase of the wave are potentiated, we can see that after carefully disentangling the stimulus evoked component from the wave modulated component, uh, we can see that, the, that on wave trials, um, the stimulus evoked response was stronger than, um, than, uh, than it was in the, in the hyperpolarized phase. Um, and if we look at this across recordings, we can see um, that this is uh, particular to wave trials. So wave trials phases prior to the appearance of the stimulus 
are strongly predictive of the stimulus evoked response when the target eventually occurs. Um, this is not to say that waves are, only, are the only thing that regulate the, the, the strength of the stimulus evoked response, but what it does say is that they're predictive. So if we look backwards in time, because they're spatiotemporally organized, we can predict the future state of the cortex and we can predict uh, 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 in a phase-dependent way the strength of the stimulus evoked response. So to put it very shortly, very briefly, um, waves do regulate the strength of the stimulus evoked response and the stimulus evoked response is stronger during the depolarized phase of the wave than it is during the hyperpolarized phase of the wave. So then what about the second hypothesis that this potentiation of sensory evoked responses increases the probability of detection? Um, here we see uh, evidence for this. So using uh, uh, the same methods that I just described for the physiology, we could, we could ask how likely is the monkey to detect the target as a function of this, of this phase? Um, and you can see that, that at the uh, pi zero or uh, uh, putatively depolarized state, uh, the monkey was um, more likely to detect the target. So you'll recall that at this level of contrast, the monkey detected the target 50% um, of the time if the phase was aligned so that the depolarized phase was um, uh, present at the time of stimulus onset, the monkey detected the target almost 70% of the time. Whereas in the hyperpolarized phase, the monkey was impaired in perception and detected it more like 35% of the time. So very strong regulation of, this, of the monkey's ability to detect the target. This is just the same data for, um, for both monkeys and comparing wave trials to, to just all trials averaged together, which is what you would see if you, uh, if you didn't uh, uh, differentiate between waves and just fluctuations in the local field potential uh, in general. So if you were reporting from a single electrode and looked at this phase measure, you would find a phase dependence. Um, but we think that is because you're mixing in trials where there were and were not waves. By looking at waves, we can much more strongly predict the monkey's success in detecting the target. So, I only have a little bit more time, um, so I'm going to go through the final part a little bit fast, um, and I do want to leave a little time for questions. Um, but this, this really uh, raised a problem for us, which is that we had a series of experiments that had built up to the point that we were convinced that fluctuations in neural activity were counterproductive, and yet here we have a form of neural response fluctuation, traveling waves, that um, demonstrably regulate um, sensitivity and give brief moments of improved sensitivity. So they can have the effect of increasing your sensitivity to stimuli that live in time. Um, so they're helping you with uh, your perceptual task. Um, and the way of sort of cutting this uh, Gordian knot is uh, to think about this in terms of, of, of sparse waves. And so briefly, um, I realize I'm running a little tight here, sorry for that. Um, we began with a large scale, about a million neuron um, network of neurons that were um, that had conductance-based synapses. So a lot of computational power and required a lot of supercomputer time to do this. Um, and we began with uh, with published work or, or recapitulating published work in which we have a randomly connected network. Uh, most people in the theoretical work don't really pay attention to the time that it takes action potentials to traverse their axons. And so a lot of the work that's been done really treats uh, the sort of default state as being a randomly connected network. Uh, and um, we could find a uh, regime that generated what is called the asynchronous irregular regime. It's a high conductance state, so neurons are potentiated and they're ready to, they're ready to evoke responses quickly when stimuli occur. Um, and you can see that, um, and, and, they, and they have the ability to generate ongoing spontaneous activity. So they can, they can keep themselves active without any external uh, input. And so what you see here in the middle panel are the spike rasters across a subsampling of this million neuron network. Um, and we're superimposing this mean rate across the network with the mean local field potential. And you can see that there's no particular structure and if we look at the local, at a model of the local field potential, which is just summing the excitatory and inhibitory conductances within the region around each point in uh, the local field potential measurement, uh, you can see that there's really no structure. There's no spatial structure, as you would expect from a completely randomly connected network. But if we simply impose 
topology to the network so that neurons near one another tend to be connected with one another. We used um, connection probabilities that, it, that were modeled on, uh, on, on anatomy. Um, then you see, and you can maybe discern a little bit, that there are fluctuations that are, uh, that are recurring with little increases and decreases in spiking probability when you look across the raster plot. And you can see that there are fluctuations now uh, in the mean rate uh, that tend, and there are also fluctuations in the local field potential, but importantly, simply imposing this topology and the requirement that action potentials take realistic times to propagate uh, along their axons, uh, we can see that, that, that we can generate um, traveling waves. So this is, these, this is a, a time, a, a frozen image showing you the, the voltage distribution at a particular point in time, but these are moving in time. Um, and because the network is large, we could produce um, a, a network which was sparsely connected. And as a result of that, we could find a regime, in a very large parameter regime, in which the difference between these two networks, the one that generates waves and the one that doesn't, uh, had no impact on the distribution of uh, mean firing rate, shown in the lower left-hand panel, or the coefficient of variation, shown in the middle, or coherence between pairs of neurons in the network, spikes by coherence. And so this is pretty, this is sort of a, a beautiful result. It says that you can impose the sorts of patterns that we observe empirically by simply incorporating distant dependent connectivity and realistic action potential propagation time. And you can do so, in a, if the network is large enough, in a sparse way that doesn't disrupt the spiking statistics or pairwise spiking statistics of neurons in the network. And so, hypothetically, it's great. We could, we could, we could have waves. We could have the benefit of an increase in sensitivity during the depolarized phase of the wave across a subset of cells uh, without imposing what we know to be uh, 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 counterproductive correlations and variability in the neuronal response. Um, so what did we actually do to get to that point? Well, we simulated um, 2,500 different um, uh, simulations of this network with different values of conductance for the excitatory and inhibitory synapses. And we found a regime, which is shown in this uh, black outline, that uh, in which the networks maintained their activity and operated in a... Um, Can I? No, thank you. I'm giving a talk. All right. <laughs> no problem. Uh, so we found a regime in this, in this um, space of excitatory and inhibitory conductance where the, neuro, where the neural network maintained its activity uh, endogenously without needing input. And it corresponded almost exactly to the regime that gives rise to the asynchronous irregular regime. And so it's a very natural consequence of a connected network that it have the ability to uh, produce waves in the same parameter regime that generates this idealized asynchronous irregular regime. Now, you can see in the lower left-hand panel that there are, um, there are contours for different size networks. And this is really where building a million neuron network is critical. Because if you get down to a smaller network, in particular the 0.5 millimeter network, you can see that the blue trace, which just traces out the lower part of the uh, triangle, is very limited. It doesn't generate these regimes. And so most theoretical models have been smaller scale. And where they have generated traveling waves, they've generated what we now understand are dense waves. They need to have strong connectivity between individual neurons in order to generate waves. They need strong conductances, about 10 times the measured conductances at synapses. And under those conditions, we see a very different pattern. Um, uh, but before I quite get there, just a couple of reality checks. So what does the network look like as compared to the data recorded in MT? So this sparse wave network um, exhibits qualitatively similar distributions of mean spike rates, uh, is what we see in the marmoset, um, shown in red. In the upper right, uh, the coefficient of variation uh, is qualitatively similar. Uh, and in fact, neither of these two measures are statistically significantly different from the data. So the, so, the, so, the, so the model, the distribution of the coefficient of variation and the data are similar um, between the marmoset and the model. 
um, and the uh, wavelength distribution of the waves is also similar. So here in yellow, we show the wavelength distribution if we shuffle the model uh, local field potential. So it naturally gets very choppy and small. Uh, but if we apply the local field potential model to the, um, to the spiking activity, then the, the distribution, the cumulative distribution function of the wavelength of the waves uh, falls nicely along the data. Uh, and finally, uh, the propagation speed, though broader in its tail in the data, uh, is similar to what we observe um, in, in the marble set. And so I, you know, I think it would have been impossible to imagine producing a model that was statistically insignificant, insignificantly not different from the data, because a model is a simplification. But uh, I think I'm very happy that the data and the model are qualitatively in close agreement under the conditions that give rise to, to the uh, asynchronous or regular regime. And um, if we go back to the smaller model, in order to generate waves, we had to uh, increase the number of synapses between a smaller number of neurons and increase the conductances to sort of unrealistic levels. But it was possible to generate waves but they were dense waves. They involved most of the neurons operating together. Uh, and um, in fact, uh, the phase uh, distribution of spontaneous spiking activity shown in the bottom right panel was very different from what we observed empirically, which are shown in, in the, the lower, right, lower left panel. And importantly, the two models differed in the way that the traveling waves affected um, the stimulus evoked response. So this is my final slide. So I'm sorry to, to have taken a few extra minutes here. Um, but um, here we're showing the stimulus evoked response in the model for the sparse wave network on the left and the dense wave network, the smaller scale network on the right. Uh, and the black line shows the um, the stimulus evoked response to a small um, afferent input to the network uh, when there are no waves. The blue lines show the response evoked if the stimulus occurred at the moment that this, the wave was in a depolarized state at the location in the map where the stimulus was evoked. Um, and you can see that there's a, there's a, there's a strong increase in the, um, in the, in the, um, stimulus evoked response uh, relative to the hyperpolarized state. But if we go over now to the dense wave network, uh, you can see that there is a, uh, a fluctuation that's imposed by the dense waves propagating across the network, shown in black. Um, and they really drive the network independent of whether or not the stimulus is present. And so the thing that we would have expected that you know, inducing strong correlations is harmful is occurring here in the, in, the, in the dense wave network. But in the sparse wave network, we don't have that problem. It can potentiate the response evoked by a, a stimulus if the stimulus falls at a time corresponding to the depolarized state of the network relative to the hyperpolarized state of the network. And so just really quickly to remind you what I just showed you in a rather hurried way, um, we, we, we found that uh, spontaneous activity is, is uh, strongly regulated by the phase of traveling waves, as is the stimulus evoked response. Um, and there is also, at the same depolarized phase, an increase in the monkey's ability to detect the target. Uh, and a theoretical model, uh, a large-scale sparse uh, wave model, can um, fit qualitatively the patterns of waves that we see and, sh and has the property that it can increase the stimulus evoked response if it coincides with the depolarized phase. Uh, but only a large scale model with sparse connectivity has this property uh, and it does so in a way that doesn't disrupt the spiking statistics of individual neurons or pairwise statistics measurably. Uh, and with that, I'll stop and take any questions. Okay, great. That was that was a really excellent talk, John. Thank you. Um, there were no questions in the chat, but if anyone wants to unmute, maybe we'll take a couple of extra minutes here for sure, one absolutely. or two questions. Yeah. I, I think I knocked them all out with an overload of data. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, uh, you know, 
dear audience, it is a complicated um, talk because of the uh, need to avoid that confound with the strength of the stimulus evoked response and the whole little segue that we had to take to look backwards in time at phase yeah. and its predictiveness. Uh, but I think that's the only way you can really do it. So I'm afraid we're just stuck with that with that uh, that wrinkle. Um, did anyone want to unmute and ask a question? There's a, there's a question in chat as well. But if someone wants to unmute, go ahead. <clears throat> I have a so, question. Uh, go ahead. This, yeah. this is Annabelle. What? So all of the behavior and recordings you showed, which are beautiful, happened with. Um, relatively simplified stimuli. What do you think would happen, and how do you think these cortical waves would interact with a more natural, complex stimulus? Thank you for that question. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was a worry that we had because there was work from Matteo Carandini and colleagues where they, they didn't look at trial-by-trial trial waves because they didn't have the technique to do that, but they computed spike and local field potential across Utah arrays in, in several animals. And they found that there was a pattern that looked like it could be a traveling wave. But they found that the amplitude and spread of the wave was very strongly reduced by the contrast of the background. And so that led us to worry about whether these waves are special to blank computer screens and therefore totally irrelevant to normal perception. And so we also recorded uh, the same data as the monkeys sat in front of a computer screen looking at natural images and they were free to look around and saccade. And we found that during periods of eye movement, there were huge waves that were triggered by the change in the retinal image. But during fixation of naturalistic images, the waves persist and they're very similar in their statistics to the waves we see in the blank background. So, uh, so I think these are basically an intrinsic property of the network that you can't get rid of by presenting a high contrast background or a naturalistic scene, and so they're probably relevant to normal perception. I have a question. <laughs> uh, yeah, so John, nice talk. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm curious if if the ways you're describing, are they, um, are they, do you see any dependence on across different animals or subjects uh, and and I'm wondering if there's an effect of training or experience or anything like that that might just suggest this other than just you know a, a phenomena of cortical tissue. Yeah, so I um, we're really interested in knowing whether these waves are just kind of the ping that naturally propagates across the surface of the cortex and moment you know you know you can imagine that it's just useful to have something that randomly puts you in a depolarized state for a moment, but does it in a spatially coherent way, so that a population of neurons are momentarily potentiated and, and enable you to see something. That's our default assumption, and the model is really predicated on that idea, that we're looking at some network property that's not governed by cognitive state. But we're very interested in that question, and in these animals, um, we didn't have the ability to answer that question. The statistics are pretty similar across the two animals. They had similar training. And the task was one in which the target could appear at one of two locations equally probably. And so we didn't vary anything that would enable the animal, if they have the ability to do this, to regulate waves so as to benefit them in the context of the task. All they did was they know, hey, at some point something's going to appear and I better move my eye to it. And so they benefited in a way that was not, uh, was not subject to their cognitive control, except maybe that they were always sort of mentally monitoring those two positions in space. But um, but I think that's a really great question. We do have a beginning collaboration with a couple of different labs who have recorded similar data in macaques in discrimination. And the animals do have more information about what they're doing there. And it may be possible to, to, to tease that out from those data. But I think the ideal kind of experiment would be one where the monkey knows it's in you know, a state like I need to attend to the left versus the right and ask whether the waves show patterns that you know, maybe the animal could be put in a state where it knows when and where the target will appear if it occurs, and it could, you know, we could test the idea that maybe the animal has the ability to control the waves and propagate them to their location to maximize their um, detection probability. Um, but I think we're just sort of Occam's razoring this and assuming the simplest model first. I think it would be really exciting. We're also looking at whether 
there are coordination, where there's this coordination across cortical areas. So if, if a wave is in a particular state in V1, does it also occur in V2 and in, in an MT, you know, in a way that's aligned across space? So those are sort of the things that we're thinking about in, in terms of how this might be organized in a larger scale. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I have a bunch of questions that we can get to in our chat, but uh, for the sake of time so that people can move on if they have classes or whatever, maybe we can collectively thank John for a really great seminar and um, look forward to chatting later. Well, thank you all for having me. It's been a real pleasure to, uh, to uh, get to present this with Kurt. This is the first time I presented it, so a little bit rough, but hopefully it came through somewhat clearly. <laughs> it was good, it was clear. All right. I look forward to talking to several of you in the near future. And okay. Bye-bye. Thank you.